not too long ago, HIP's president and CEO, who I think is right there taking a picture of me right now, uh, had a conversation with the author, Carmen Rita Wong, and Carmen says something that has stuck with me for, I think, at least a month. And she said, we can't achieve our way out of the color of our skin in a racist society. And so I have been sitting with that for a while now and was thinking about what we were going to talk about today. And quite frankly, this is the reality that we have to sit in right now, and especially with everything that's been going on over the past few years and then thinking about the midterms that are coming up. And I know that a lot of people in this room and especially our partners and allies with Hispanics and philanthropy have been thinking about the different ways that the American dream simply wasn't designed to apply to them. And the, the few people who are able to achieve this idea of success have really had to buy into a system that isn't for us. So what we've seen in the past couple of years legally is that a lot of these rights that we have fought so hard for, that our ancestors fought so hard for, are being systematically taken away from us and then taking this American dream and making it more and more narrow. At this point, many of us, I know me personally and my family, we are overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed with dealing with COVID and other health issues, with racist attacks on our families, on our lives, and just our way of being, but then also to deal with attacks on our fundamental freedoms is really putting us at a point where we have to make some very specific and difficult choices. So today I'm really pleased to have Joe Scantleberry and Paul Ryan today to help us talk through some of these issues and we will have time later for all of you to come and engage with us, ask us questions and, and let's see how we can push some of the edges around these conversations today. So, Paul, actually no, Joe, I'm gonna start with you. We'll start with you. So. With Living Cities, you have this ability to bring a network of donors and investors together, and you're looking at both some really critical research, but also making investments. So over the past few years, what has Living Cities learned about, especially looking at the racial wealth gap, and how can those lessons be applied to think about how we invest in democracy? Yeah, sure. Well, good morning. Um, first, let me say a little bit about Living Cities, what it is. We, we are a 31-year-old philanthropic collaboration that has actually committed itself to both financial institutions and private foundations coming together to try to innovate and let's see how far we can go together. So there's been a long history of work. As we think about closing racial income and wealth gaps, a couple of things we've learned. First of all, it requires intentionality. It requires us to actually look at race explicitly. And I know a lot of funders, that's kind of an uncomfortable space. I know financial institutions, that's an uncomfortable space. But it's a space that actually speaks to the inequities that we see across the country. It's part of our history. <clears throat> and in this capital com conference, right, we're, we're here talking about capital innovation. I've been watching pitches right and left. I've been sitting in the garden watching really in energetic conversations of really hopeful people. Well, part of the challenge that we have going forward is we always have to vision what is the hope that we can all exercise. So some of the things that we've learned is that through our Catalyst Fund uh, commitments, we've learned that we can drive change. We've learned through our Blended Catalyst Fund, for instance, that fund managers of color clearly find and see entrepreneurship and opportunities with people of color at a higher rate than white capital investors. We've seen that the 1.3% of the 69.1 trillion that's invested in global capital assets and that 1.3% that is dedicated towards women and people of color, that limited investment is stifling. It actually undermines our ability to expand opportunity and undermines our ability to actually move democracy forward. And more importantly, we can talk about equitable economies in cities and at national levels and in political campaigns, but if we ultimately don't solve the flow of capital, we won't get to where we should be. I'll stop there because we can go on, I know that. No, absolutely. <coughs> uh, and something that I want to hold on to and come back to is this idea of hope and exercising hope because it's not just a thing that's either there and you have it or you don't have it. You have to actively practice it. So let's hold on to that and come back to sure. it a little bit later. But Paul, you also work with a group of donors who are specifically concerned with our civic engagement and the state of our democracy. So we'd love to hear from you as well about what 
your donors are thinking about right now, what they're most concerned about, and what they're focusing on. Thanks, Hilda. Um, good morning, everybody. So I've been at the Funders Committee for Civic Participation only since April of this year, and I have, uh, prior to that, 20 years of experience in the democracy movement as a lawyer and a policy expert and a nonprofit manager and a fundraiser, and I bring all of that experience to my new work in philanthropy. So I've worked with philanthropists for decades, and now I'm working in close partnership with philanthropists. So what are they doing in this moment? Um, first of all, they are organizing. They are coming to events like this to ensure that their grant making, their gift giving is in alignment. Um, they cannot be, you know, effective philanthropy cannot be siloed. There has to be collaboration between funders. Um, they're joining groups like the Funders Committee for Civic Participation. So if you're a funder of democracy movement work and you're in this room today and you're not a member of FCCP, please go to funderscommittee.org forward slash join and check out our membership criteria and, and consider joining us. We'd really appreciate having you. Um, you know, for a long time throughout my career, I've noticed that funders really tend to like proactive, creative work. That's the type of democracy movement work they've preferred to fund, as opposed to more reactive or defensive work. But I think January 6th was really a wake-up call for many of us, me included, um, and including funders and philanthropists. They've realized, and I've come to realize, that many of the institutions and practices around democracy, how we do elections, how we run government, that we've taken for granted for decades, they're under threat today. They're under very, very serious threat. So I want to um, emphasize the importance of doing not only the proactive, uh, creative type work, but also to really invest in the defensive work that will help defend our democratic institutions. This is done in the field on a variety of different ways. I'm going to talk about two specific types of work, policy, public policy work, and litigation, and how these, this defensive, important defensive work is showing up there today. So um, on the legislative landscape, there was a silver lining to the COVID pandemic, which is that um, we saw a rapid, dramatic expansion of voting accessibility measures, laws that made it easier to vote safely and securely either from home or early in person with lower concentrations of voters, anything to avoid big crowds, long lines when the pandemic was raging. I've been working for more than 20 years to try to implement some of these policy wins and we got them in a very quick order when the pandemic hit. So silver lining there. Um, I'm wondering how many of you before the pandemic stood in lines to vote. And in this year's election and in the last elections recently since 2020, you've voted safely and securely from home. My family, my wife and I, filling out our ballots at the kitchen table and walking them to a drop box two blocks from our house. And I love that accessibility. I wanna keep it. I want us to celebrate those wins. But be clear, those wins are under attack today because the elections did not go the way, have not, recent elections have not gone the way that regressive forces, authoritarian forces, white supremacist forces have wanted them to go. So we're seeing attacks on those recent expansions. We're seeing attempts to roll back these new voter accessibility measures and we need to fight those and philanthropy has been helping and needs to continue helping that fight. Um, and compounding this need to defend these recent gains is new attacks on voter voting rights. Um, we've seen an emboldened right attacking um, really, really basic measures with vote suppression efforts. Things as simple as you know, making it illegal to hand out water and food to people waiting in line to vote. Really inhumane um, rollbacks or attempted rollbacks in voting rights. So that's some of the defense we need to play on the policy front. I want to talk about two pieces of litigation that are closely related. The U.S. Supreme Court this term is hearing two important elections related cases. One was argued a couple weeks ago. It's a um, redistricting case out of the state of Alabama by the name of Merrill v. Milligan. And in that case, the state of Alabama's Republican-controlled legislature adopted a new redistricting map after the 2020 census that um, created only one black majority district um, out of a total of seven, when numerically black voters make up more than 25% of voters in the state, They're actually about 27% of the voters in Alabama. At a minimum, black voters should have had two majority districts on the new state map. So this case has um, the plaintiffs, some voters and some voting rights groups challenged this new map. They won um, before the lower court, the three judge federal district court, and the state appealed to the US Supreme Court. 
Um, and there, the state has argued before the Supreme Court a really, really radical concept, which if they end up winning this case before the Supreme Court, it will effectively gut Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which is really the last big remaining piece of the Voting Rights Act that's been on the books since the 1960s. So what's this radical argument? They are arguing that it is unconstitutional under the US Constitution to consider race at all when drawing redistricting maps, even when it's done in an effort to comply with the Voting Rights Act. And it's an absurd um, proposition. It's an absurd argument. The Voting Rights Act was enacted specifically and intentionally to build voting power of long excluded communities, most um, centrally black communities. So um, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson made a very compelling argument or rebuttal to the state's arguments during the oral argument saying, you know, you want to talk originalism? Let's talk originalism. Let's look at the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. They were all enacted. They were all ratified specifically to undo prior wrongs against the black community. So um, their purpose was to empower black voters, and the Voting Rights Act is perfectly permissible, and the consideration of race is not only permissible, but necessary and required. So that's one important case we're going to get a decision on later this year or early next year from the Supreme Court. The second, another elections case, is out of North Carolina, another case that introduces um, by the state's lawyers a radical argument that state courts have no power to review or declare unconstitutional or illegal laws passed by the state legislature around elections. Now, you may have noticed if you read the description for this event in the program, it talks about separation of powers. It talks about um, these long-standing principles they are under attack in this case out of North Carolina that fundamentally would undermine the principles of separation of powers if the Supreme Court were to agree with the state that state courts can't consider the constitutionality of legislature passed election laws. So keep your eyes out for those cases. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll stop there, but very important defensive work as well as offensive work to be supported by funders in this critical moment. Thank you. Joe, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Sure, sure. So I, Paul and I agree, we're both lawyers, but he was going to do the lawyering here and lay out the legal case. Um, when I hear what, what Paul just shared, which is very powerful and compelling, you almost feel powerless. <clears throat> you almost feel that if I'm not a lawyer, if I'm not litigating, if I'm not, um, you know, close to Supreme Court clerks who could influence the conversation, I guess I just have no way of moving this. And it's up to a handful of people to make a decision to make things happen. Um, and that's far from true. Everything we have, all of the inequities that we see in our society have been created intentionally, maintained, and sometimes their genesis is forgotten, right? Sometimes the genesis is forgotten, which is why Justice uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson's pull on original interpretation of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are so important, right? We actually have to understand how these inequities were created. And that's something that is part of all of our heritage here. It's all part of the society we live in and continue to pay taxes into and support. And at the same time, I think about the struggles that people who were excluded, all of the creativity, all of the ways in which people who were excluded historically found ways to thrive, found ways to push forward. And I think about cities. Cities are places where we're proximate. These are places where we see one another, bump into one another, and we all know that neighborhood we don't want to go into. And what we don't realize is that neighborhood was created intentionally whether it be through red, you know, uh, redlining, whether it be through restrictive covenants, whether that be through the lack of investment in those communities. These are things we can undo. Heather McGee and the sum, uh, the sum of Us really speaks to that very, in a very hopeful way. And I think part of our challenge is that we all have to demonstrate hope. In living cities, we have a network of 21 cities who have committed to closing racial income and wealth gaps. And they're all trying different ways of approaching that work. And we're learning from them. We're not funding it all. But what we have done is we've created the space for them to, look, to think intentionally around racial equity, to look at their data, 
to look at how they disperse public dollars, to reconsider their housing patterns and their transportation patterns, even things as fundamental as san sanitation and water access. Some of you are familiar that water access really matters. How do we get to these grand inequities? Through policy, as you've heard, but also through our lack and our unwillingness to engage with one another around investment. That's key, and in, a, and in a gathering like this, where we're talking about impact investing, the conversation is no longer one of, well, should I make a charitable contribution to a fund manager, to a fund manager of color? Should I be moved by a lynching that I happened to see on television during a pandemic when the whole world was watching? Or should I be fundamentally reconsidering my business, how I do business, why I haven't found women of color as equal partners in innovation and ideas? Should I re-examine why I don't see men of color, and black men in particular, as equal partners in work? Should I re-examine that, and how do I do that? So that's a personal journey one has to take. And you know, the good thing is that there's Google, right? I don't know any people of color. I don't know a lot about racism and indigenous people's history. Google, it's right there. Audible, it's right there. You can learn, read, you can do it while you're driving. It's accessible, it's easy. But now let's build the other part. Let's build relationship. Let's connect. Let's talk about and know that we're all on this learning journey together and this journey of recreating the society that we should have. Is it gonna happen overnight? No, it's not. But if we don't begin now, by the time we are a nation that is very clearly no longer a majority white nation, we'll still be operating with the inequities that were created to advantage some over others and to exclude others. We can begin to undo that now. I think cities are a place to do that in a really, really discreet and clear way because the people and the needs are evident. They're all around us. They become the grist of every election campaign. You talk about it all the time. Look what's happening in that city and the other city. And frankly, as cities go and their economies thrive, rural communities, suburban communities also can prosper because it's one economy. So my hope is that even as we have these struggles, that we continue to think about ways to innovate together and that we build relationship together. And this is very hard work because frankly, there's always fear fear of the folks coming over borders. We've had people run on that, on that xenophobia specifically. We have people running now on that fear specifically. And we, are there concerns and debates and policy issues to be discussed? Sure, well, but, but would anybody in this room feel comfortable watching children caged? I think not, and yet we did, and yet we did. So, trying to stay hopeful, but I'm also pushing us to think about what we see as not someone else's responsibility, but all of our collective responsibility. I dare say, working with the members that we have and working with the tremendous staff that I, I just became the CEO of Living Cities last year, working with the staff that I have, we have this dynamic tension where we're in relationship, trying to really think through, what does a long-term commitment to building equity actually look like? and being comfortable with the fact that racial equity is not something we just achieve through a grant or through a DEI statement or commit. It's actually an investment in a long-term process and a process of inclusion. And for those of you who are profit-oriented, a profitable one because the people that you engage become your co-creators, your co-investors, your partners, and your customers. Thank you so much. And I want to pull this thread a little bit about the connection between cities and rural places. I am from a very rural place. I grew up in this rural place. Um, and my politics do not really align with the, uh, the predominant politics there. But so far, it's been very civil, and so it's OK. Um, but th the reason why this connection is so important is because there is a sense that cities sort of control, and there is a lot of tension between where I live and even Chicago. Uh, Springfield, the capital, doesn't really, it's not even a blip on the map, really, as, as far as conversation goes. And so with HIP, what we have done with our new power building and justice program, which we call PB&J, is very intentionally 
use research that we had commissioned to see where our communities were growing in places where the resources weren't matching that growth. And so we are working in the South, in both cities but in rural places, and ideally with organizations that have access to multiple areas where our communities are bubbling up and have a presence but don't have that access to power. It also investing in the kind of work where folks can see themselves. So it's not just about talking only about elections or talking only about Supreme Court cases, which are important, but some people can't access that, right? For people every day, they want to talk about how does this affect my economy? How does this affect the ability for my children to go to school and be safe? How does this affect my, my health, you know, my bodily autonomy? And so through our work, what we're trying to do with a small group of folks is, again, like you said, invest for the long term, build their capacities and their agency to feel and see themselves as part of this bigger democratic system that we're trying to build and ultimately get to a place where this idea of capital is much more integrated with, with the wholeness of who we all are as people in, in this geographic space. So I yeah, appreciate you making these connections. Paul, I want to go back to you. Um, so you are fairly new, and Joe, you're also fairly new, but you have a long history in, in these spaces. Are you saying we're old? No, 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 no. I'm probably older than both of you. <laughs> <laughs> but what I am saying is that you are not just people who have been living in a philanthropy pod, which I actually have been living in a philanthropy pod. Um, and so what I, what I wanted to ask you was, quite frankly, we are in this particular place despite years of investment that have been done in certain ways. So what are we getting wrong, and what should we be doing? I'm going to share four specific areas for growth and improvement and change in how money is moved, how grants and gifts are made in the democracy movement. First, movement organizations on the ground, they need multi-year general support grants, not short-term, project-specific, strings-attached grants. Um, this is vitally important. And this money you know, it needs to be coming to these organizations 12 months a year, every year of the election cycle, not um, flooding into these organizations in the six months leading up to an election and then drying up for the next 18 months. That You cannot build and sustain a movement with that type of funding. So multi-year general support grants is number one. Number two, funding grassroots organizing um, with metrics or deliverables that really accurately reflect what it takes to build power in communities. So instead of incentivizing with the requirements for a grant, the number of doors you knocked on, the number of robocalls that were made, the number of email blasts that went out, the number of sort of contacts, period. Um, that is not an effective measure for how movements are built. And instead, funders need to be supporting long conversations on doorsteps, not as many doors as you can knock on, but a 30-minute deep canvassing type conversation where education is accomplished, where relationships are built. Um, there's, there's some of this going on. There is a very important project being funded by a collaborative of funders. The Democracy and Power Innovation Fund is funding the um, organizing lab at Johns Hopkins, where they're really studying, using social science approaches to study what actually works, what is working to build power in communities instead of these um, tired metrics that are ineffective. Third, there is insufficient funding of C4 activities, 501C4. This is issue advocacy and lobbying activities. This is also some um, actual election-related work. And philanthropy has long been shy about fully utilizing the scope of activities that are perfectly permissible under tax law and other laws, um, but they've nevertheless shied away from it. So the Funders Committee at, for Civic Participation, we're doing a lot of programming to engage with funders to help them understand how they can better align their funding with these 501c4 type activities. And fourth and finally, funders need to demand that groups receiving their support have truly inclusive and diverse staffs, membership, board composition at every level within these organizations. Um, so to that end, it's not true within the movement today. There are a lot of organizations that are white-led, white-run, predominantly white culturally, and not truly supportive and inclusive and diverse internally. And we're not going to build a successful movement until we have movement organizations that are truly diverse and inclusive. So I want to pitch to you today. Joe mentioned at the outset, he's hearing a lot of pitches today. If you go to democracypipeline.org, you'll find a very brief description on a website that I've set up of a passion project of mine. I need to raise two million bucks to launch this thing. Budget for year one is going to be two million dollars. 
What this is is uh, creating a set, a cohort of paid summer interns and two-year fellowships to build a truly diverse and inclusive movement um, or pipeline for democracy movement professionals. This is across all departments that are necessary within movement organizations to make movements succeed. So I'm talking about not only legal and policy where I got my start, but also the fundraising piece, the communications piece, everything that's required to run a democracy movement organization. Um, so democracy pipeline project, diverse and inclusive pipeline of next generation movement professionals, and the final component of this fourth takeaway is invest in youth organizing, specifically youth of color around the United States. This is vitally important. This is our future as a movement and as our nation. Thank you. Um, Joe, so I want to ask you the same question, but I also want to add a little bit to it. Um, so folks have been talking about fund us like you want us to win um, you know, and funding people to win. So can you actually unpack for us, like, what is that winning? What is the winning that we're really looking for? And then what are things that everybody in this room can be doing? Sure. So first, let me just double click on everything Paul just said. So I'm endorsing all four points. Double click, double click, double click. Um, and definitely go to their website and see what that work is, because it's critical, frankly, building the movement for democratic participation and democracy. We just have to be committed to that. It's just the basic. Um, what does the win look like? So imagine yourself on a plane. You don't know where that plane's gonna land. And you don't know what city it is. There's no announcements, you land. And you get in a cab, taxi, and you drive around and you see lots of people, lots of diverse people, but you can't find the ghetto, the hood, el barrio. You can't find where the color line begins and ends. Imagine yourself in that scenario. Now some of you are going, I can't imagine that. Except in an all white city, maybe somewhere. But even there, there's poverty and need. But imagine what that would look like once we recognize that that was created intentionally. Maybe not yeah, through a specific draft of a pen, but the intention to exclude in business, in education, in housing, in nutrition, in health. We see all the data. Some of us call it the footprint of racism. We see the data, it's there. And most of us are working on the edges of the footprint, like the laces, <laughs> you know, the laces or the tread, rather than dealing with the foot itself. My hope for us is that when we think about a win and what philanthropy specifically could be doing and what investment capital could and should be doing is building relationships. So that yes, you discovered post George Floyd that there were lots of organizations who had need and they were led by people of color. Great. And you're gonna do that for a season until it's no longer brand new. Cause that is the pattern and it's been the pattern. You're going to use words like movement and organizing, and that'll be the new template for your grant proposals. And anti-racism and equity. And then you'll move past that in another season. But the condition remains. I'm not asking you to be outside of the phenomena. I'm asking you to be conscious of the phenomena. I'm asking us to be intentional about the phenomena and to set the goal that we remove the barriers to participation. So in the capital arena, 1.3 of a trillion, of, of $69 trillion of global investment, asset investment, 1.3% of participation by people of color is appalling. And that's not legislated. Those are individual decisions by investors. Those are people in this room who are watching and listening to all the pitches that are coming and all the hopeful ideas that are being presented and saying, okay, well, I'm gonna give a token to that country. I'm gonna give a token so that I can be part of that rather than I'm going to build a genuine relationship with the people who are pitching to me so that we build something together. Philanthropy has to shift from the place of we're going to solve to we're in partnership with communities, 
partnership with people, and we're not always going to agree, but we're going to stay in relationship and build, and build the society and the country we should have. So that's what I would add, and double click. <laughs> Thank you. We have some meaty questions. Go for it. So I think um, I think what I might do looking through these is I'll do two little rounds because if we do all of them together, your head would explode. So first up, and I'm going to paraphrase, folks. Okay. Uh, the first question is about dark money and what can we do about dark money, and then the other question is looking at the Supreme Court and what can everyday people do about what is happening with the Supreme Court. Who wants to go first? I'm happy to start. There you um, go. So on the dark money front, there's a little bit of good news in terms of where our court's jurisprudence is around money and politics, and that is the court has not yet gutted the public's right to disclosure of money and politics. We just need elected officials, legislators, to act and to strengthen those laws. That will has largely been lacking at the federal level and has more or less been lacking at the state municipal level too, with a couple of exceptions here or there. Um, so without getting too deep into the weeds, although we have Supreme Court decisions like Citizens United where the court said um, unlimited corporate money in politics, disclosure's the sort of the silver lining where we can still, if we muster the political will, enact laws that do shine light on dark money, that eliminate dark money with, with stronger disclosure laws. What was, there was a second part that was also? Supreme Court. Supreme Court. Elections matter, everybody. And we have the Supreme Court we have because we have this, had the Senate that we had and the President that we had from 2016 to 2020. Um, there's no way to sugarcoat it. And these are lifelong appointments. But there I will say the ray of hope is that the Supreme Court has never led this nation to anything. <laughs> The Supreme Court is largely reactive and reflective of where the broader society is. So we need grassroots organizing. We need to change the public's sentiment on these important issues that matter so much to us. And um, trust that the Supreme Court will eventually follow. But it's going to be, we have some ugly years ahead of us at the court. Yeah. But they're not the leaders. We're the leaders. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I just pick it up for that because I think that is, that's really the bottom line. Um, at the end of the day, I know so many folks who are despondent, discouraged, and at times, well, who am I really going to vote for? It doesn't really matter. Yes, it matters. And it matters because that is a fundamental way in which we, at the local level in particular, make decisions of who's going to lead, who's going to direct resources, who's going to actually set policies that help grow businesses or grow communities. The Supreme Court doesn't do that. We do that. And when we choose not to participate at the levels that we have chosen to not participate, except if there's something sensational on the ballot. I mean, you know, nefarious, but I, you know, I think the former president was trying to put uh, marijuana on the, on, you know, make it a federal law to, you know, I was like, this guy will be reelected in a minute if he gets that through, right? Because so many folks I know, oh, I care about that. I'm going to do that. The reality is, is that We've got to be more than single issue participants. We have to consider the whole. And that's hard to do when we're all busy, when we're tired. Hilda began with how tiring this all is, how exhausting it all is, how despondent it all is. Do I have to wait for another lynching before you see me? Well, the truth of the matter is, is that I can't let that be the litmus test of my engagement and our engagement. I think about all the people who've come before us, and they weren't always a majority, but they were critical in continuing to move us forward. And all of us have family stories of sacrifice and struggle and heroism and courage in whatever form they show up. It's our time, and it's not just our time for our moment and our issues. It's our time for the future that we expect to see. Um, it was said yesterday, I think Janae Queen Nazir talked about this in her comments. She talked about Eddie Glade's book, Becoming Baldwin. And there's a line in there where he says, imagine, just imagine, if we could start this whole thing over. And it was you and I starting it over. What mistakes would we repeat? And which things would we learn from the history and innovate forward? I'd like to think at an impact innovation 
convening that there are people here who are bold enough to try something that is just off the cuff, really on the, on the razor's edge, but actually is the source of how we grow and how we build and what drives our economy. That courage to try something new, I think that's required of us right now. And to see it in both civic space, private sector space, certainly philanthropic space, because in philanthropy, other than the tax code, there's nothing holding us back from doing what we can do. So let's do it. I have a question here that I'm going to ask singly because I think it, it merits a deeper response. What do each of you think is the root cause for such a large number of Americans responding to the clarion call of authoritarianism? And how can we reverse this disturbing trend? So the what do each of you think is the root cause for such a large number of Americans responding to the clarion call of authoritarianism? And what can we do to reverse this trend? Oh my goodness. So um, I was sitting on my couch when September 6th happened, when, excuse me, January 6th happened. And it, it was just such an odd scene. And I'm in Maryland at the time and I'm watching this and this is right down the road. And I'm thinking, is this happening? Is this really happening? And then at the same time, as I realized it was happening, I remembered it happened in Wilkes-Barre. I remembered it happened across the South. I remember it happened in Reconstruction. I remember it happened in New York City. I remember being chased myself in Bay Ridge Bensonhurst when I was a high school student, black kid in an Italian Irish New York neighborhood, not supposed to be there, but I was going to school. And I persisted to go to school. I remember. And I'm sitting here saying to myself, wow. Horrible thing to see, amazing to witness. But then I asked myself the question that some of you probably said, what if these were black and brown people? What would have been the response? And I had my own answer. You may have had yours too, and our answers probably would, might be the same. And so I asked myself, okay, so if we're at the place now where, where our fear of a changing America an inclusive America and our attempts to bring people together, if we're at the place where it has us ch caging children at the border, storming the Capitol, threatening, then what else do we need to wake up? And I don't mean being woke. I mean being active. I mean double clicking. I mean paying attention, building relationship with the other, examining how we reinforce this evil weed called racism in our society. And I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't want to be partisan here, but I had to admire Liz Cheney. Some of you watched her. I had to watch her and Benny Thompson from Mississippi stand up and say, this is not about party. This is about the democracy itself. And we refuse to be sycophants, we refuse to accommodate, we refuse to go along, even if it means we lose an election. That's courage, that's a profiling courage in the most classic example, and it's courage that we all can learn and build from. I'm gonna co-sign Joe's response and I'm, I'm gonna respond myself in a way I think that probably reinforces it. Um, what has created this climate that has made us so receptive to authoritarianism? I think that was pretty much the question. White supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, sexism. Um, this is who we are as a nation. This is who we have been for several hundred years as a nation. Um, we are changing too slowly, but we are changing. We've been a nation of progress for several hundred years on all of these fronts, I believe. But these problems within us are still here. I know because I was raised swimming in these isms. I was raised as a white, straight, cis male, um, oblivious to all of my privileges for the first 20 years of my life. And the past 30 years of my life, working to unwire this stuff from me. 
And there, there is no finish line. This is going to uh, be a lifelong project for me, for sure. And we all need to be doing this. Um, you know, my lane, I think, most specifically is talking to white folks about white supremacy and straight folks about homophobia. Um, you know, because I know it because I am it. It's within me. I'm trying to get it out of me. But I think, you know, explicitly and implicitly both, probably more troublingly the implicit piece of it because it's harder for us to recognize in ourselves. But we have a lot of work to do on these fronts as individuals and as a society. And I think that's, that's why we are where we are. Thank you. We have a question here about, please. Yeah. We have a question about who we bring into some of these conversations, and specifically, um, someone is asking, frankly, why we're not engaging more with folks in the national security, foreign policy, and political strategy spaces when we're talking about securing our own democracy. Um, I guess the short answer is at least some of us are, and that's something that was new to me. I, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019. I'd been in this democracy election law space for um, 15 plus years at that point, and it was the first time in my career that I started meeting with the national security folks because we as a nation, um, not me as an individual, elected a president who posed a very serious national security threat to the nation and threatened our, not only our election systems but all sorts of national security issues. So um, those of us who are working on election security issues we are collaborating with um, national security folks because we do view both on the technology front, what are our actual voting machines and systems, how vulnerable are they to attack, how do we make them less vulnerable to attack, short answer, paper ballots. Um, but, but it's a great question and I think it needs more attention perhaps, um, you know, maybe in the press, but I will assure you that the, the folks who are doing the policy and the legal work, we are collaborating definitely with national security folks. Yeah, I think there's a lot of innovation in this space and a lot of relationships that get formed, particularly from um, when I think about philanthropic leaders, the rooms that they walk through and the engagements that they have. <clears throat> the thing I would want to lift up from the question is whether we all feel like owners of the whole. So I may feel like owners of a particular issue. I may feel like owners, so for Living Cities, we're concerned around economic inclusion and opportunity and how we drive that, demonstrate that, so that, and how we lift it up where it's happening well so that it can be replicated. But we are hopeful that as we demonstrate what's possible, that Americans will pull the possible. And we've seen it already. Even the call for long-term grants and general operating support, that's something Liberty Cities pioneered years ago that is now just part of what we call trust philanthropy and responsive philanthropy and all the various labels that we innovate every couple of years. But that said, I think thinking about ourselves as owners of the whole is part of the challenge, right? How do I think about the problems of a rural community? How do I think about the problems of national security? How do I inform the conversation as opposed to leaving it to the voices of narrow interests and narrow views? So I'm gonna tap on one legal case here. It's an old case. Um, so the insular cases, right, these are cases that spoke to the citizenship of Puerto Rico, the status of Guam, and, um, and the basic point that the Supreme Court took was, um, yeah, these people are part of the American order. That's our territory. And some will be citizens and some will be nationals, but they can't possibly blend into the America, into America. They can't possibly. Now, it, to me, it was a page out of how we've treated tribal communities in terms of sovereignty. Yes, you're here, but we're not going to respect that sovereignty. We're not even really going to consult. We're going to do what we want with you and with your people and with your land. We're at a different point. All of us see Puerto Rico again and again and again and again losing power. And we ask ourselves, why is that? It's not that far from the US. Can't we figure that out? Well, we don't have an interest in figuring that out. And we as a nation don't see fully that this is who we are all together. So part of our challenge is how do we actually continue to raise those issues regardless of ancient court cases, 
that in effect said these people will never be us. Because now as I look at us, this is us, all of us, all of us. And so the court case is stale, but it still sits there. Almost Plessy v. Ferguson all over again. Still sits there. And it informs our thinking, it informs our practice, it informs our behavior. We have to do better. So I think we have to become owners, full owners, and partners in building it. Absolutely. I'm going to add a question that I have been mulling over lately, and it's come up a lot, especially these past few weeks here, um, being in the Bay Area. Um, let's talk about information and disinformation and the role that that plays, especially in this time leading up to the midterms and thinking about what the next election will look like, and specifically in Latino communities. We have become very aware of the role of disinformation in Spanish media and how that kind of infiltrates and gets to the space of you know, influencing my parents and what they think and how they consume. So one, why do you think this is becoming so prevalent? And two, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just step out here because I actually think it's very important that we challenge those things that we know to be false, mm -hmm. those things we know to be narratives that need to be changed and shifted, but we also have to create new narratives. And I don't mean create new narratives because we need to tell a tale, I mean create new narratives because at the end of the day, narratives inform our connection mm -hmm. to one another. Um, a mentor of mine once described how she was on a plane with someone who she knew the moment she sat down, it was gonna be an issue. Okay, MAGA hat, the whole nine, and she's just like, oh, geez, no. Can I get another seat? Well, it was first class, she didn't want to move, so, <laughs> so she wasn't gonna go. But by the end of the flight, somehow they got into a conversation. Now me, I would have been headphones and bourbon, and that's the end of that, okay? But somehow she, being more gracious and bold, got into a conversation, and the conversation ultimately, when it ended, was this individual sharing the story of their son, their children, the struggles they were going through, the needs they had, the things that she knew in philanthropy that could inform the challenges they were facing, that human connection. So his labeling, his self-labeling, and her intentionality around connection changed that narrative immediately. I think we have to lean into both our, uh, our institutions, particularly those that we own, Univision and others, those, those are ours, right? And are, and we have to really speak to them speaking the truth. So as an Afro-Latino, I have to say, when I grew up watching telenovelas with my family and seeing people in blackface, I would, be, I would flip out. I was like, what is that about? Are you kidding me? You don't have one black person in all of Mexico, Venezuela, or Colombia? Really? Really? Open a door, go look outside, right? And over time, we've seen some change. Not sufficient change, but we've seen some change, right? Those conversations, however, have to continue to happen within and without. And I think that's part of the way we get there. The hard part, though, is that there's such a ubiquitous volume of noise coming at folks that, frankly, so many of us have just tuned out from all the noise. It's become white noise and become inevitable noise. So relationship matters because when I say to Paul, or Paul calls me and says, Joe, I want you to pay attention to this, my relationship with Paul and with you makes me pay attention in a different way. So some people call that organizing. Some people call it family. You gotta build it together. Absolutely. Somehow we've gone from oh. five minutes to three seconds, but Paul, please go ahead. Um, Quick response, which is I will encourage you if you're interested in election disinformation to go to paulsryan.com. That's S as in Seamus, paulsryan.com. Go to the policy writing page, and the top um, item you'll find is a report that I co authored and served as executive ed editor for right before leaving Common Cause. And we published this report last fall. And it goes through the entire problem of election disinformation from a public policy lens. It's a 70 page report. There is no silver bullet response. The responses or the policy solutions lie in several different areas of law and policy, um, including, for example, voter intimidation and false speech laws, campaign finance laws, federal communication laws, 
federal consumer protection laws, state media literacy laws, and state privacy laws, as well as the social media corporate policies of entities like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Um, complicated problem, complicated but attainable solutions, and again, check out this report on uh, um, my website. Uh, the title of it again is, As a Matter of Fact, the Harms Caused by Election and Disinformation. All right, so we have a minute back. Woo! Final words. Paul, you start. Final comments, final reflections, final calls to action. I just want to thank you all for coming this morning, getting out of bed, getting here early first thing, and thank you for my fellow panelists on stage. It was really nice sharing the stage with both of you. I want to thank Hispanics and Philanthropy for putting us together and giving us an opportunity to have this conversation. And I want to ask everyone in this convening to really think through what does it look like to invest in partnership with people of color and to make that an intentional step.